I've been listening to all kind of eclectic music yesterday. So um, let's have a look. First of all, this is um, the album Computer Energy by Uwe Buschkötter. Now, Uwe Buschkötter is, uh, first of all, this is a good address for someone who likes to have um, full and complete collections of somebody's albums because Uwe Buschkötter made only one album. So once you have this, you are done. <laughs> now, um, he's a German composer and uh, someone who made a lot of uh, like TV film music and advertising jingles and all this kind of stuff on the dark side of the musical power. But um, in the 80s he created this one album and uh, that's why I wanted to show it to you. Now the sound of this album is uh, well, certainly somewhere in the area of jazz fusion. It has uh, Kurt Kress on drums. Um, it has Ian Bernson on electric guitar. Ian Bernson, uh, who was uh, the, the guitar player of uh, the Alan Parsons project. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a touch of um, touch of crowd rock in it and a touch of jazz fusion. And the rest you have to imagine yourself. Now this is a later reissue. And uh, so this album, it is still around, but um, if you see it somewhere, have a listen, maybe you like it. This here is uh, Wild and Moody by Yukihiro Takahashi. Now I've already shown a lot of Takahashi albums. This one might be my favorite one. Um, it is, uh, well, like, like many Takahashi albums, it starts with an instrumental, which is sort of a left field, far out, experimental, almost sometimes, like in this case, almost um, touching on industrial music. And from that it slides in the sort of expected jazzy, soulful music by Takahashi. Um, every of his, almost every of his albums has one... Um, sort of statement like a cover version. In this case it's Helpless by Neil Young. Sometimes it's a song by the Beatles for example. Um, the second song on this album, Stranger Things Have Happened, is a really wonderful song uh, followed by Kill That Thermostat. And um, as you would expect um, there is of course a lot of Harumi Hosono on it and Ryuichi Sakamoto and also Iva Davies from Ice House or Bill Nelson for example. By the way, that's what I really like about these kind of projects. Um, this is not, it's the same like, it's, it's the same with the albums by Ryuichi Sakamoto. It's not like they are sitting in the studio and kind of invite these famous and expensive instrumentalists just to play on their songs. But um, if you look closer, it's, um, it's a different kind of uh, cooperation. These guest musicians are not just hired hands that come into the studio, play their part and, and leave again. They are always, and this goes for Takahashi stuff as much as Sakamoto stuff, they are always involved into the, into the production process, into the writing of the songs. Which also means that as songwriters and co-writers they are included in the royalties of the albums. So I always thought this is nice. Um, and it's a, it's a bit of a misconception about this kind of albums that uh, oftentimes it is thought that this is just some kind of a luxurious thing like let's come this guy, let's have this guy, let him play on my record. But um, if you look closer you realize that this kind of musical relationship always goes a bit deeper. Now the next album is of course a famous milestone. This is E2 on E4 by Manuel Göttingen, a legendary album from the early 80s. Now uh, this is a re-release, so I bought it new. And here it's basically just a chessboard. There's a 
some nice. Uh, this is very heavy vinyl. This feels like 200 gram. There's a nice label here. Now this sounds really good. It's a good addition. Now of course uh, Manuel Göttingk is the Ashra Temple guitar player that uh, uh, left the band and uh, many stories start, start like that, right? That left the band and sort of buried himself in the studio to come up with this album. And by doing so created this rather revolutionary uh, LP which envisions the world, the world of electronic music. This is a very electronic album, and even though he was a guitar player, um, this is uh, this was synthesizer music at the cusp of uh, the electronic development back in the day. This is a groundbreaking sound, almost a premonition of uh, of techno music. So um, yeah. I don't need to say much more about this because it is a milestone for sure. Now to stay in the in a similar vein, uh, let's have a look at this. This is uh, Klaus Schulze, the X album. Of course, it doesn't mean X. It doesn't mean it. It means ten because it's the tenth album by Klaus Schulze, um, and uh, it's a double album, and uh, it's an interesting one. Probably not the favorite album for some Klaus Schulze fans, simply because it's it's uh, it's a bit different than the rest because it uses an orchestra. But I think it works very well uh, the way the orchestra is uh, included into this uh, synthesizer-driven environment is pretty clever and, uh, uh, and very it's very very ambienty. Now the great thing about this double album is, of course, the booklet inside the gatefold sleeve, which has a lot of photos from Klaus Schulze's career, a lot of Tanger and Dream pictures, and uh, a lot of liner notes. So who would not love that? And so on. Very fascinating stuff. A lot of. Uh, Stuff explaining the the composing and the, the thought process behind his work. And finally, this one. This is of course Rainbow Dome music by Steve Hillich. Um, came out on Virgin. Let's see the green one. Now this is a reissue, um, an Italian reissue, not the best quality, it's rather thin vinyl, but it sounds good. Um, I mean the cover is a bit cheap and banged up, as you can see. Oh, I love this album. This is a wonderful ambient album. Now this album has only one track on each side, and it's, it's a huge uh, ambient layout. The only th I really like it, but the only thing that always puzzled me about this album is um, if you look at it and see how big the, the contribution of Mike Girardi is on this album, then you kind of wonder why it is called a Steve Hillage album and not a Hillage and Girardi album. That's what I would have done. But I assume there were some kind of a business record company oriented reasons for that. I don't know. But if you look at it, the, the A side, Garden of Paradise, is mostly a Mikkei Girodi track with uh, mostly her music on it. And uh, Forever Rainbow, the B side, is more dominated by Steve Hillich, I would say. Yeah, it's not a very valuable copy, but it still sounds good, so why not? I must say, I'm not much of a. Um, edition hunter uh, because if I were I would need a second job and a massive change of my lifestyle and that's not gonna happen so um, thank you for tuning in and see you next time bye bye